Hi there fellow primates, welcome to this video. I hope it finds you well on this overcast Friday. Hope you've had a good week so far. I did, although I did get my first cold in two years. A lot of uh, coughing, sneezing, sore throat, but um, I tested negative, so it wasn't Omicron, thank God. But now I've cleared up enough to uh, record this video without grossing you out, so that's good. Um, I want to start by saying thank you to those of you who left some comments underneath last week's video and uh, on Facebook or send me an email to say that you are enjoying these videos. Um, it's nice to know uh, that that's the case. Uh, and it's important for me to know that I can just continue with these videos as I have so far because I enjoy making them as well. So all is good in the world. Now, this week I want to talk about something like lighthearted and, and, and superficial, like the nature of reality, specifically the nature of evolutionary reality. So if I would ask you to image in your mind's eye what the basic reality of evolution would look like, what kind of picture would you draw? <clears throat> now, I think most of us uh, would draw something very much like an image I saw in a paper published last year in Biological Reviews, a paper written by José Padial and Ignacio de la Riva on species and classification. And they included uh, this particular image of lineages evolving through time. I think for most of us, this is the type of image that we would think of when we think about evolution. The spatio-temporal extension of evolving lineages of ancestors and descendants through time. Sometimes these lineages diverge, sometimes they fuse again. And when they diverge permanently, they give rise to new taxa. So this unbroken uh, genealogical continuum of lineages is probably what most of us think is the bedrock reality, the bedrock ontology of evolution. Not a surprise. It's been uh, the core idea of evolution ever since evolutionary theory was established in the 19th century. But you can see a problem already arise. How do we relate this ultimate reality of evolution, of evolving lineages, to the observable bits of biodiversity that we see out there in the world and that we find in cabinets and drawers in the museum? taxa, species, because of course um, lineages can't be seen. They are inferred by doing comparative research on observable taxa. So how do the two meet? And this is one of the issues discussed in this paper by Padrial and de la Riva. And it was also part of a paper that was published in the museum journal, Systematics and Biodiversity. Uh, this journal is being edited by uh, this dude. This is my friend and colleague Pete Olson. Um, and he was over for lunch a couple of weeks ago, and he said, dude, did you see this paper by Andrew Brower in, uh, in, in my journal? And I said, no. He said, well, there's an interesting paper. It's titled A Slippery Reality, the Epistemological Shifting Sense of Tocogeny, Phylogeny, Lineages and Species Delimitation. Pretty big mouthful. And he said, it's right up your alley. You should give it a read. So I did. And in this paper, Andrew Brower takes issue with the paper by Padial and de la Riva. He doesn't like it. Now, I've been reading Andrew Browers' papers over the years. Uh, he always is a very powerful uh, thinker, uh, very insightful, thoughtful writer. Uh, his writings have been a whetstone to sharpen my own ideas over the years. So I'm always interested to, uh, to read what he has to say. But in this case, I, uh, I had to disagree. Uh, and what he takes issue with, amongst other things, is the basic core truth or reality of the evolutionary worldview that is depicted as consensus in the paper by Padial and de la Riva, namely that evolution is all about the continuous evolution of diverging and fusing lineages through time. He says that all that is gained from viewing taxa as lineages is a patina of metaphysical reification whose meaning and validity is entirely contingent on the evidence and the epistemological lenses through which it is viewed. Another big sentence. Uh, now, he helpfully included a glossary uh, after his paper. I don't know if Andrew uh, Brower thought, oh, I'm using difficult words, I better include a glossary. I don't think, he, well, you don't see those often in papers. Um, or maybe Pete read the manuscript and said, what the hell is reification? In any case, uh, he defines metaphysics as propositions about the state of objects and processes as they exist in the real world and reification as the treatment of an abstract idea as a concrete entity. So if you use these translations and you reframe what he said about the patina of metaphysical reification, you get something like this. 
all that is gained from viewing taxa as lineages is that that makes an abstract concept look on the surface like a concrete entity that exists in the real world. Hmm. Not sure if I agree with this. Because uh, as an example of reunification, Andy Brower gives ancestors and phylogeny um, as abstract ideas. But they aren't abstract ideas. Ancestors and the phylogeny uh, that connects ancestors and descendants are hypotheses about concrete things that we think once existed in the world. So they are not abstract ideas, they are hypotheses about concrete things. The whole ontology of evolution uh, that thinks about evolution as changing lineages through time uh, is based upon the material continuity of these things. It's, it's about concrete things, if you think about lineages as things. Uh, people like Michael Giselin and the late David Hall developed the individuality thesis that thinks about lineages as things, or maybe you consider lineages as processes. For instance, John Dupree, who works at the University of Exeter, uh, sees lineages as flowing processes through time. In either case, they are material, concrete things about which we have hypotheses. They're not abstract ideas. So thinking about lineages and ancestors is not some sort of category mistake, some logical mistake, uh, you know, a reification of an abstract idea. Uh, it is something else entirely. But right from the start, the thinking of people uh, who think that evolution is all about lineages and people like Brouwer diverges. He said, well, you could perhaps think of taxa-like species as chunks of lineages, but only uh, if you are, are already freighted with a great deal of microevolutionary background knowledge. Because if you aren't, well, then talking about taxa as segments of lineages uh, is as vague as referring to species as chapters in the great story of life or some more florid metaphor like twigs and buds. And it's a bit weird. Because haven't we, in more than a century and a half of research in evolutionary biology now, uh, established enough micro-evolutionary and macro-evolutionary knowledge to know that this is solid background knowledge, to know that this actually points at an unseen inferred reality that we can now uh, convince ourselves uh, is really there. Uh, Brouwer would disagree. Brouwer thinks we are still in the stage where we are establishing the validity of evolutionary theory as a real scientific hypothesis. And I think we are way beyond that point. I'm more than willing to take the background noise that we have accumulated on board and on the basis of this conclude, the unseen reality we are reconstructing with our research uh, reveals lineages evolving unbroken through time from the beginning of evolution right up to the present. All evolution happens at the leading edge of lineages as time ticks away. But he disagrees. And it becomes important uh, to understand this disagreement because, again, how do you connect the observable bits that systematists work with, that all biologists work with, species and other taxa, to this unseen reality? If you look in his glossary, Brouwer defines lineages as unbranched series of ancestor and descendant species through time. And he gives an example in the text, uh, for instance, one that runs from the Archean beginning of life to Homo sapiens. Hmm. But there you can see the problem. If there is this one brand, unbranched lineage through time, say from Homo sapiens to the origin of life or to the origin of the animal kingdom, that's essentially one single unbroken time extended population. I guess it's only one species. Because the taxonomy uh, that we use to diagnose taxa and study the relationships between uh, usually considers them not in a diachronic framework as instances that change over time, but in a synchronic framework where we just look at things without a time dimension. But if you think about lineages, they are of course diachronic, they go through time. So if you then start thinking you have an unbranched lineage and it's composed of ancestor and descendant species, well, where do you demarcate the species? Exactly the point discussed by Padial and De La Silva in their paper in Biological Reviews, and one that gives people like Benny Brower a massive headache. And it should. It is a difficult uh, issue. How do you cut chunks out of this unbroken continuum of lineages and give them Texan identities? It's not surprising, though, because Andy Brower 
is a patent cladist. And if you summarize their convictions concisely, patent cladists are epistemological purists. They are epistemologically very cautious. They don't want to infect their research with unproven, unwarranted assumptions about evolutionary processes. They want to stay on the straight and narrow of empirical research, the characters they can observe in their study organisms. Um, and I admire that, that uh, epistemological purity I can see a logical justification for it. Um, they want to stay away from evolutionary storytelling. However, this creates a problem because the reality that we as biologists hope to discover parts of is invisible and is located in the invisible realm of unseen entities and processes. Uh, but clearly just don't want to go there. So they connect this sort of admirable epistemological purity and cleanliness to sort of ontological agnosticism that I find almost a bit cowardly. Um, so right at the start, the ultimate reality of evolution, um, people like myself and Pat and Clay, they start to diverge and we can no longer understand each other. Uh, I am willing on the basis of the knowledge we have gained about evolution over the last century or more, um, I'm willing to uh, accept that the bedrock reality of evolution is diverging and fusing lineages. Pattern cladists, um, they still stay on the brink of this decision and they are not willing to fully jump in. Now, it is a, an interesting topic that I discuss more fully in my uh, forthcoming book. Uh, and this thinking about lineages as the bedrock reality of evolution, uh, I call this in my book lineage thinking. This is a phrase that I have had to coin because Proper evolutionary thinking requires proper lineage thinking. Uh, we have other terms uh, about specific types of thinking. The most popular one is probably tree thinking. It was coined in the 1980s by Robert O'Hara and has become ubiquitous in the literature ever, ever since. And it focuses on the reality that the relationships between taxa are those of collateral relatives, different cousins that come from common roots. That's what tree thinking is all about. But I understand the nature of systematic relationships, of the collateral uh, relatives, the relationships between collateral relatives in evolutionary diagrams, you need to have clear lineage thinking as well, because that is the realm of how these things came to be. Because we've all done lineage thinking. It is the type of thinking your mind engages in when you think about the origin and evolution of any trait or taxon of interest. Uh, that sort of linear thinking where you try to see how the thing you're interested in has changed over time from a particular point in uh, an evolutionary lineage up to a point of interest like a terminal taxon. And to give an example of this from the March issue of the journal Bioessays, um, this is a paper on the flagellar germline hypothesis written by an emeritus professor called Charles Lindemann. Uh, and he came up with an idea that in order to evolve complex body plants, you need the right molecular machinery. And it turns out that a lot of complex cells and organs and tissues are built in part with the molecular machinery that makes flagella and cilia. And these are, of course, very important structures, uh, for instance, in mobile gametes. So if you want to understand the evolution of complexity, uh, you need to understand this continuum of the flagellum flagella germline uh, going back hundreds of millions of years into the evolutionary past right up to the point of the last common ancestor of eukaryotes which you can see in this particular tree is called Lika where flagella were already present and they have remained conserved morphologically and molecularly right up to the present day in many taxa including our own and so in order to think about how the molecular machinery evolved and the flagella evolved over hundreds of millions of years, um, you engage in lineage thinking. But Charles Lindemann, that's the type of lineage thinking that is all too familiar because it is wrong. Now, before I read out what he has been written, we have this, I have to conclude that Charles Lindemann is not a phylogeneticist. He probably isn't an evolutionary biologist. He is a specialist on the molecular workings and structure of flagella and cilia. But when you read what he writes, he writes, for instance, uh, about the search for a unicellular ancestor of animals 
um, a strong case has been made for the coenoflagellates. Now you can see in this tree the coenoflagellates are a sister group of the metazoans of the animals. The coenoflagellates aren't the ancestor of animals at all. They are the nearest relatives. They are equivalent sister taxa. But here I'd know. Uh, coenoflagellates are closely related to sponges. Well, but they are close related, equally close related to all other animals too. He goes on to say that sorry, sponges have been proposed to be the monophyletic root of the animalia. It's like, but, but no, sponges are uh, in a tree that he would accept the sister group to the other animals. So the way he is thinking is this very traditional linear thinking, which is characteristic of lineage thinking, but using the tips of trees where the terminal taxa live. Um, and treat them as if they were ancestors. So I drew a very uh, beautiful diagram here. He thinks like coenoflagellates gave rise to sponges and they gave rise to the other animals. But of course, in reality, this is not how it went. Uh, it went like this. Coenoflagellates are the sister group of animals. Sponges may be the sister group of other animals. And evolution goes along the arrows that go along the internal branches of the cladogram or the tree. This is where the lineages are. There are no uh, there is no lineage directly from coenoflagellates to sponges to other animals. Coenoflagellates are monophyletic clade, so are sponges, so are the other animals. There is no arrow between them. But it's this sort of naive linear thinking uh, that you can see often in students, uh, in the early literature, in people who have not been trained as evolutionary biologists, that is manifest in, in the paper. He goes on to say, for instance, a consensus is forming that sponges are the root lineage of the metazoa. And he uses, again, a temporalizing or linearizing language where sponges are at the root giving rise to the other animals, which is unwarranted. They are sister taxa. The two papers he cites for this particular conclusion are from 1994 and 1995. I don't think Professor Lindemann has been consulting the recent literature at all. Uh, which is quite funny. He goes on to say, you know, sponges are basal to eumetazoa. No, sponges are the sister group to eumetazoa. There's no arrow between them. They're equivalent sisters. They're cousins. They are not related as ancestors and descendants. He also refers to uh, clades as clads. So he just goes to show that he is not really an evolutionary biologist. And he talks about the group Uniramia, and if you are a taxonomist of arthropods, that's an old group that's been dead for a long time. Onycophorans, insects, myriapods together to the exclusion of crustaceans and chelicerids. <laughs> uh, this, this group is, is, is dead as a mummy, uh, but yet he, uh, he still refers to it as. I, 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 this paper, I don't know who reviewed it, um, how this got through. The hypothesis that Charles Lindemann presents, the flagella germline hypothesis, is worth reading. It's an interesting paper to read. But it's this kind of incorrect linear lineage thinking that is rife in some parts of the literature, where you are linearizing uh, things that are actually collateral relatives. Um, but he's not alone. Um, and it is very even, you know, if you've worked in evolutionary biology, studied animal evolution for decades, it's, it's easy to make this mistake. For instance, a paper published in 2015 in a book uh, on the origin of animals written by Jim Valentine and Charles Mar Marshall, both from the University of California Museum of Paleontology. They talk about the coenoflagellate ancestry of sponges. Sponges are not the descendants of coenoflagellates. Um, it's a completely different matter whether the ancestors of sponges and all other animals was coenoflagellate-like. But this sort of imprecise linearizing language is extremely common. The other thing happens as well, where people should think a bit more linearly, but they don't. And there's an interesting um, example of this in a paper, the title of which suggests that, well, this paper should teach you the right way to think about lineages in evolutionary trees. Understanding evolutionary trees in a journal called Evolution, Education and Outreach. Uh, it's, it's dedicated to educational audiences, uh, to science teachers, for instance. Um, and it talks about, you know, and it is a good paper. I assign it to my own students, uh, and it, it, it teaches the basis uh, of tree thinking really, really well. 
But there's also some things in there which are glitches, and they're glitches of lineage thinking. For instance, one of the things he discusses, uh, the author T. Ryan Gregory, is, you no, know, did we humans evolve from monkeys? And a lot of people said, no, no, we didn't evolve from monkeys. So he says, and I shall quote, you know, um, the, the answer, so the, the question, if, if humans are descended from monkeys, and this is what uh, lay people sometimes ask, then why has no one observed the monkey giving birth to a human baby? And uh, Gregory says, well, the answer is simple, because the premise is flawed. Humans are not descended from chimpanzees or monkeys, and no sane biologist suggests otherwise. Indeed, humans aren't descended from chimps. But aren't we descended from monkeys? Alongside this text, he includes this tree. <clears throat> And you can see here the New World monkeys, the Old World monkeys, and a clade of the apes, including humans. And in the legend, um, Gregory writes, Old World monkeys share a more recent ancestor with apes, note Y, than either does with New World monkeys, note Z. Which means that apes, including humans and Old World monkeys, are equally related to New World monkeys. Absolutely fine, I agree. And then he writes, monkeys are not ancestral to humans. The two lineages are related as distant cousins not as grandparents and grandchildren. But, but there, there are three lineages. There is a lineage leading to New World monkeys, another one leading to Old World monkeys, and another one leading to apes. That's three. And what do you call the creatures uh, that belong to the lineage that exists between Z and Y? Those are monkeys. Uh, uh, and the only way you can infer that what you know, the nature of these creatures were like on a tree like this is if you apply lineage thinking, if you interpret cladograms and all kinds of other branching diagrams between taxa as uh, reflections of genealogical relationships. So lineage thinking, of course we evolved from monkeys. These monkeys are extinct and are not members of the old world monkey clade or the new world monkey clade, but they were nonetheless monkeys. And yes, we evolved from apes. And yes, birds evolved from dinosaurs, from a specific lineage of theropod dinosaurs. But if you think only in terms of taxa, um, you can't come to this conclusion about that a little bit more later. Well, you think, come on, Ron, you have been you know, tra trawling the literature to find this one example about somebody saying, oh, we didn't evolve from monkeys. And uh, it's actually a really common ploy uh, in the educational literature. Um, for instance, if you take a book by Donald Prothero, which he dedicated to Niles Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould, um, and he uh, wrote this book called Evolution, What the Fossils Say and Why It Matters, with Archaeopteryx on the cover, the same example um, about the evolution of humans from monkeys. Um, he concludes that thinking that we come from monkeys is simply wrong. And if we believe otherwise, we would be living in a web of lies. It's like, well, but, but, but Donald, you present a tree in your book that is almost exactly the same as Gregory's tree. It's like the, the tree shows, because the monkey lineages are paraphyletic with respect to apes, that we did evolve from monkeys. And he's like, no, no, it's a web of lies. It's like, well, but, but earlier in your book, you write, we still have the genes for the long tails of our monkey ancestors. Well, oh, well, sorry. And there you can see, it's easy to slip. Um, yes, we did evolve from monkeys. Yes, some part of the brain of Donald Prothero remembers this, but a couple of hundred pages later, he has forgotten it because he's obsessed by thinking only about terminal taxa. And tree thinking becomes dangerous if you forget that these terminal taxa, which are collateral relatives of each other, which are not related to each other as ancestors and descendants, but as relatives, that realm is completely different from the lineage realm where the hypothetical ancestors live that connect all these collateral relatives. So in order to avoid a flaw like this in your thinking, we need to apply proper lineage thinking. You go to the creature on the cover of his book, Archaeopteryx, and he talks about how creationists always fuck things up. Creationists say, yo, Archaeopteryx is not an ancestor because modern birds are not descended from it. Uh, and he says, well, first of all, uh, there is no such thing as a missing link. That's a surprise to me. But then he says, you know, okay, even if Archaeopteryx is not a direct ancestor, it, it was certainly a collateral ancestor. A collateral ancestor? No. There's only two different things in a tree of diverging lineages. Relatives, which are not related to each other as ancestors and descendants, and ancestors and descendants. So 
You can be a collateral relative, but not a collateral ancestor. That is a contradiction in terms. It's a category mistake. You're either an ancestor or a relative. Um, don't confuse your mother with your aunt is another way of putting it. Um, so it is even for professionals, for paleontologists who study uh, you know, deep evolution, it is still quite common to see that they misapply lineage thinking. And I, in my book, discuss a whole range of other examples of where things can go really wrong and conceptual flaws can uh, be spread widely uh, when you get lineage thinking wrong. Now, I will just finish by saying that it's easy, even if you think like I think that I got it right and I think about these things properly, to get things wrong even without realizing it. If we go back uh, to the paper by Ryan Gregory, he writes, you know, one might expect it to be possible, at least in principle, to, re to reconstruct a tree of life, branch by branch and bow by bow, from the kind diversity residing at the outermost twigs to your universally shared root. Quite a nice sentence. But there's something already wrong with this metaphor when we try to visualize in our mind's eye this tree of life. Uh, the words twigs and branches and boughs, they faithfully depict um, different parts of a tree, with boughs being large, branches being smaller, twigs being the smallest. Um, where people use words like stems or worse, trunks of trees. Uh, if you think properly about fully resolved phylogeny of taxa, um, all the little bifurcations are equally thin. They're just time extended populations through time. When you go closer to the root, where uh, you know you, you, the, the branches don't become thicker, the, the thing wouldn't look like a tree. It would look more like a quite often diverging, but sometimes also fusing, anastomosing fabric. Uh, some places you focus and zoom in and it looks more tree-like. Some bits, for instance, think about prokaryotes. Uh, there is a lot of fusing, a lot of hybridization. It looks more like a meshwork. It doesn't look like a tree uh, at all. So even you know, with words like this that describe characteristics of specific metaphors, we can start to confuse ourselves and think this is what this thing would look like if you could actually draw it in a two-dimensional way. And it just goes to show that we create our own realities in our mind's eyes, and they can differ from one person to the next. Um, for instance, this guy, my friend and colleague Dave Williams, he still teaches students that um, we did not evolve from apes, and that uh, birds did not evolve from dinosaurs or aren't dinosaurs. And what he says has logical validity if you only think about organisms being representative of taxa. But we now know, or I think I know, is that these taxa are part of a one unbroken continuum of lineages. And then the problem is, you know, how do these taxa uh, relate to the lineages? The big problem is that if you talk about evolutionary processes, which are recorded in these lineages, with the terminology of taxonomy, which is all about taxa, you inevitably get a problem. You get logical problems when you use the language of systematics to talk about evolution. There's a, a cladist called Gareth Nelson, very influential theoretician about phylogenetics, and he put it this, uh, taxa, don't exist as biological phenomena related as ancestors and descendants. And there you go, right there. Um, well, but then you have an incommensurate uh, field. You have the taxa, products of evolution, but then they must have come from somewhere. Well, if you use taxic concept and language, you can't precisely express yourself. What would you call the lineage between Z and Y in the tree of, of Gregory, between New World Monkeys and old world monkeys. Well, is that a, a family? Is it, and how does it, how do you relate the observable bits of biodiversity that we call taxa to the underlying reality of evolving lineages? Uh, this is difficult. Um, and Dave's reality, Dave's reality is very different from mine. I'm going to drink with him next week, and in the pub, our realities will become very, very close. And with that. The reality is I've been talking for 29 minutes, that's more than long enough, uh, but this is a topic I think of fundamental importance and I find it very interesting. I hope you enjoyed it too. If so, please like it, subscribe to the channel, uh, sign up for alerts, 
Have a lovely weekend and I hope to see you next time. Bye bye.